I'm Sylvia Arenas, council member uh, for District 8 and uh, also the chair for Neighborhood uh, Services and Education Committee. So I'm calling the committee to order and um, I think we're going to take roll call. Jimenez? Cohen? Esparza? Here. Carrasco? And Arenas? Here. We have two at the moment. We just need one more. Okay. So we will. Um, oh, Councilmember Carrasco says she can't get in. I don't see her name on Zoom at the moment as a panelist. I'm I'm asking her to maybe call in. Okay. And maybe that would be easier. So we will um, wait until Councilmember Garasco gets online. I see that Sergio Jimenez just logged in. Wonderful. Okay. We have a quorum. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna get this show on the road. Um, there are some time limits. Uh, there gonna be, there's gonna be some time limits on our items uh, because we are going to lose quorum. Uh, so I'm going to ask my colleagues to restrict their comments uh, to five minutes. Uh, for each of the items um, so that we can get this uh, show over the <laughs> finish line and make sure that everybody um, gets to present and we can have a, um, a thoughtful discussion. All right, so I'm going to begin with uh, reports to the committee since there's nothing on our work plan and there's uh, nothing on our uh, consent calendar. Chair um, Dennis, we, we did under orders of the day uh, Request moving item three, uh, the housing item, to be uh, to move it to be heard first. If that's okay with you. Sure, absolutely. So we'll call a citywide residential anti-displacement strategy status report. This is the item item three D three for those of you who are um, listening at home. Go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Chair and Council Members. I'm Kristen Clements. I'm with the Housing Department. And I'm joined today by Emily Hislop, Reagan Henninger, and Omar Passan to give you a quick update on the anti-displacement work that the city has been engaged in. Um, first, we'll let Emily give updates on our COVID response and our statistics there. And then I'll come back, give updates on other initiatives, and we'll wrap up. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, before we get started, sorry about that. Um, just a reminder that our anti-displacement strategy that the City Council uh, approved in September of 2020 focuses our work on these top four recommendations, response and recovery to COVID, anti-displacement and neighborhood tenant preferences, developing a proposed program for a community opportunity to purchase and um, working on underrepresented communities in commissions with a focus first on lived experience representation on the Housing and Community Development Commission. Um, good afternoon, council members. Um, first slide, this is about um, the status of the state rent relief program, which closed to applications on March 31st, um, but there's still some being processed, a few left. Um, as of August 21st, 
2022, $127.8 million has been paid on behalf of 10,620 City of San Jose households. Of those households, 9,079 are from extremely low income and very low income. Um, that means in 2022, a four person extremely low income household would earn less than 50,550 a year. And a four person very low income household would earn between 50,551 to 84,250 a year. So um, an overwhelming amount of uh, the recipients of rent relief are from these um, extremely low income and very low income households. A total of 107.2 million has been paid out on their behalf. 59.3 of these applicants in the city of San Jose are Latinx headed households and 62% um, are extremely low income households. I also want to note that HC staff um, assisted at least 1800 of these households um, through the all stages of the rent relief process and 70% of the uh, households that we assisted were primarily Spanish speakers. Um, we should note that there was a legal challenge to the California COVID-19 rental assistance program brought by tenant advocacy groups. Uh, the lawsuit was brought against the State Department of Housing and Community Development in June 2022. Um, legal aid and tenant advocacy orgs alleged that the HCD ran the program in an opaque and discriminatory manner and that tenants weren't given every opportunity to be able to provide the necessary information to get their rent relief application through the process and were unnecessarily uh, denied. Um, they also alleged that many denials were unjust, tenants provided were provided with inadequate information and no meaningful, meaningful way to appeal the decision. Um, the judge issued a preliminary injunction against HCD in mid-July, which bars the programs from issuing final decisions. Um, what that means for us is that a positive of this development is that our staff has been able to work with tenants who may have um, had their rent relief application denied for curable reasons. And in a close partnership with staff at HCD, we're able to hope, open some cases back up and cure the, um, the deficiencies or inconsistencies in their application and get proper relief paid on to tenants and landlords. Um, an update we shared in our memo, which we shared, I believe, at the last um, NSC committee meeting, um, when the rent relief program was announced that it would be closed on March 31st, um, we wanted to find a way to be able to to assist tenants that may have not may have missed that cutoff or their application was still pending because at the time they would have not been protected anymore. Um, we still launched this program. It's been tremendously successful using our uh, ERA one leftover dollars from the local program and existing contracts that were in place with uh, Sacred Heart. Um, we have this temporary, very targeted program to intervene in evictions of tenants where the eviction is based on whole or in part on non-payment of rent. Um, it's currently administered by us with the Sacred, with Sacred Heart Community Services, but also with the support of Destination Home in the county. Other partners um, include this Project Sentinel Day of Court Mediation Program. This voluntary program is, is really for tenants who are at imminent risk of eviction where they have an unlawful detainer um, lawsuit pending or about to be filed um, and that they meet other criteria so we are able to fulfill our obligations with um, with federal treasury guidelines. So the federal monies though that we're using um, to, to intervene in these matters must be obligated or promised by September 30th. So we are working as hard as we can to get as many um, tenants and landlords paid and avoid forced evictions. Um, so this program should catch any tenants who still may still have an application with the rent relief program pending after June 30th. Um, the program is really a collaborative effort. Landlord and tenant attorneys are aware of the program and the judge in the unlawful detainer court introduces our city staff who are on hand at least two days a week during the unlawful detainer calendar. Um, they introduce the city staff, mediators and Sacred Heart representatives at the beginning of each calendar to let litigants 
know what resources are available. And this is where we're able to identify um, cases that are literally at the precipice of a tenant being forcibly evicted. Um, so we also wanted to, whoops. Okay. In addition to this program um, and our presence in court, we were able to launch a weekly holistic unlawful detainer clinic at the Superior Courthouse beginning on June 1st. Our clinic partners um, are, of course, the court, the county, the court self-help center, which it has a staff member on hand to assist it again with uh, filing paperwork. Sacred Heart um, Community Services is there to connect um, tenants and needed landlords to um, re financial and other resources. Um, Destination Home and, of course, the Project Sentinel Court Mediation Program are um, also partners in this effort. These, this clinic is, is open to tenants and landlords who are involved in active unlawful detainer actions. They get assistance with court filings or legal referrals, access to mediation services and other resources to help resolve their court action, avoid an eviction judgment and work towards more stable housing. The goal, which has been a goal for several years, I believe, is to have this weekly holistic clinic be a permanent part of the UD process. Um, I will say that we've been able to utilize things we already had in place with the eviction help center, that this is almost like a satellite. We get people the legal referrals through an intake system we developed with our legal aid partners um, and are able to help get tenants and landlords connected to all the resources that may be available to help stabilize housing and get landlords paid any back rent that's owed. Um, this clinic and our diversion program firm up our last line of defense in preventing displacement and utilizing federal funding to address the regional housing stability issues that were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so to summarize our eviction diversion efforts for the fourth quarter, um, at our eviction prevention help centers and at court, 625 households have been assisted in person, either completing or appealing rent relief application, and 2,231 were assisted by phone with a similar task. 239 households received legal services from Law Foundation and Bay Area Legal Aid during our virtual and in-person walk-in hours. 10 of these individuals were have assisted in person and 229 were given legal counseling and advice by phone. We had we participated in 18 outreach events and community engagements and at least 60 households uh, during the quarter were assisted at court. Our eviction diversion and settlement program um, it, during the fourth quarter got uh, 48 cases and for the quarter 175 thousand was paid out to property owners, which resulted in stabilizing 10 tenant households. That number now is up to 15, and we have 56 cases in process trying to reach that September 30th deadline. Um, I want to note that given the continuing need and um, the market increase in non-payment non notices and UDs based on non-payment, we are working hard to identify other funding sources and amend our contract with Sacred Heart so we can continue this diversion and settlement program through the end of the calendar year. And I'll pass it over to Chris. Thanks, Emily. Um, as expected on the other initiatives involving housing policy staff, um, staff capacity to advance tenant preferences, our community opportunity to purchase program proposal and commissions work was extremely limited as housing policies team was working very furiously together with our long range planning team and other departments on developing a draft six cycle housing element um, to send to the state, which hopefully will happen later this month. Um, but the work that we did do, uh, we're going to highlight our work on tenant preferences in the last quarter, which was actually pretty exciting. The city's co-sponsored legislation um, that Senator Cortese introduced for us, uh, Senate Bill 649, advanced through um, the assembly 
it was introduced in the Senate last year. It got put on hold as a two-year bill and then advanced through the assembly, through policy committees, and through a floor vote successfully and is on its way. It's actually on the governor's desk now, hoping or hoping for a positive outcome and for the governor's signature so that it can be signed into law. A reminder that this bill is necessary for uh, tenant preferences for people who are in danger or at risk of becoming displaced um, as defined by individual jurisdictions in their own preferences. Um, it would legally recognize them, so it would have more enable more certainty for councils to say yes when projects using tax credits and bonds um, wanted to use the preferences. So it's uh, an exciting prospect that this bill could go into law. So we will wait and see. Um, second, we have been waiting for guidance um, from the State Department of Housing and Community Development as to how they would review our proposed preferences as a lender when they are funding the deals that could all the preferences would be used on. Um, although we met several times with the state on our proposed legislation, they have declined to state when they expect their draft guidance to become finalized and issued which leads us to think that it may be time to rethink our work plan, advancing um, without the state guidance, using their draft guidance instead, um, but proceeding anyway, um, realizing that preferences may not be able to be used on deals that use state money, um, but at least it could be used on some other deals going forward. So as we develop the third bullet, the city's program proposals, um, we would be re-examining and recreating a project proposal uh, later this fall and of course use the guidance that we do have, um, knowing that again, the, the universe of what it would apply to would be more limited than we would like, but it would be a start. And then um, we have been, we are in the middle of recruiting for a FUSE fellow to come and join our team for at least one year to advance this work and we, we are hoping for a start date around Halloween. So later this fall, um, we hope to be able to gain a lot of ground on the tenant preferences work. So in summary, for the projects that we listed uh, work plan items for in the attachment A, um, and of course the anti-eviction and eviction diversion program work, that Emily and her team and many people in the department continue to work on um, will continue. But these special projects that have work plans, um, these are the items that we expect to advance in the next quarter. We will know more about the outcome of the legislation and uh, hopefully the governor will be supporting hiring a FUSE fellow to staff that work and create the program with us and do the analysis per state guidance uh, draft state guidance and um, and come forward to council after doing outreach to stakeholders and potential program users to craft the program. Uh, for the community opportunity to purchase program, which we lovingly call COPA, um, we do have a two-year fellow from the Partnership for the Bay's Future on the team working on the proposal. We plan to, which we had deferred, due to housing element work, but we are resuming work on that. Um, we plan to do further community outreach this fall, release a revised program proposal. Um, we continue to coordinate with our partner in the community, Somos, um, to also is with us in the PBF cohort. And um, we plan and hope to advance the program proposal for COPA after more community work this fall and then in the spring um, with approvals uh, occurring in the spring. Um, finally, with the commission's work for, to onboard the lived experience commissioner onto the housing and community development commissioner, uh, commission, um, we're very happy to report that we have um, onboarded a new staffer onto our policy team, um, Mindy Nguyen, who was formerly in District 3's office who is very experienced in housing issues. And she is ready to take on um, this work where our former chief of staff left off. 
So we are um, talking to the clerk's office about amending the application, doing outreach again to those groups that we coordinated with about what the lived experience seat might need and those kinds of supports. And so to begin the recruitment together with the mayor's office and then, um, and then she will be working with me as I'm a senior staffer for the commission to implement the supports and other needs um, for that seat with the hopes that we would have it filled in the next few months. So, um, so we're happy about the progress and that it's just around the corner filling that seat. Uh, I also wanted to call your attention as we wrap up um, just to the proposed cadence for our reports back to committee. Um, as you'll note in the memo, since spring in 2021, we have done a lot of report backs to committee. This is our 12th general update to either NSE or the Community and Economic Development Committee or the full council on our AD work in 18 months. So going forward, our proposal is that we return um, to NSE every six months for a general update and that we return as needed to CED with general updates. And of course, as we do program development, for instance, for COPA, those programs themselves, of course, the approval paths for those programs, they would have their own visits to committee. So with that, happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we are gonna go to the public before we take uh, comments from my um, colleagues. We have one speaker, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. My Zoom may cut out really quickly. So just to, hi, uh, just sorry, this is Blair Beekman. Uh, my Zoom may cut out quickly. So just to quickly offer, uh, thanks a lot. For this time. And Here, uh, I don't know if my, but uh, I, I think I just tried to offer that, uh, and that uh, this is a really meaningful, helpful, and uh, thank you for all your good work on such an item. Thank you. That was the final public speaker. Thank you, um, Council Member Sparza. Thank you, and I'm also having some connection issues, so I'm gonna try this with my video turned off. If that, uh, hopefully that helps. Um, so thank you for the report. Um, I'm gonna start by thanking the Franklin McKinley School District for hosting the Eviction Help Center. Um, I, I like to really publicly thank them. They, we have a very long partnership with the city uh, and Franklin McKinley going back 25 years. Um, and uh, it's a relationship, a long relationship and one based on really the meeting the needs of, uh, of the community. Um, and that's really important. So I wanted to say thank you to them um, and address the uh, eviction help center. Um, Omar, we are not moving the eviction help center to Foxworthy Avenue. Is that correct? The eviction help center is being moved back to uh, to into the location. It's uh, they're in the process of working with Franklin McKinley to uh, extend the lease and then get the get them uh, in there. The lease expired uh, last week, but uh, we're working quickly to to get that back in place. Thank you. And we're looking for the needs, looking at the numbers, the needs are greatest in District 5 and District 7. And um, although we meet the needs of everybody in the city, um, but just numbers wise, the, that's, that's where the need is greatest. And that's where we're looking for, um, we're, we're in the process of looking for a more permanent site. Is that correct? Uh, yes, council member, that, that, that is correct. We're uh, working with um, some existing partners and, and trying to identify very quickly 
uh, a site that will serve the community uh, directly where those needs are, are greatest. Thank you. I appreciate that. I just wanted to put that out there um, uh, because it, it says, uh, you know, Foxworthy Avenue or Kirk in the report. And I just wanted to, to put that out there. I think, um, you know, one of the great successes of, uh, of the COVID response is our, the partnerships that, that the county and the city and all the nonprofit partners and, and other entities um, that we've really come together to serve the needs of those uh, who really uh, need it the most. And so I wanted to, um, to put that out there. I had some questions also on um, on the legal services, um, and it's not very clear. I know we have a number of contracts out there for a number of different things, um, but for example, it mentioned that 500 households received legal services in one year at the help centers. Um, but there were 48 cases since May. Uh, are those included in the numbers? Do we have a table? Because I've, I've gone through the memo and the um, presentation, and I see them sort of programmatically, but I don't see them, the numbers collectively. Are we tracking that collectively where um, all these different needs are. So like the eviction diversion efforts where we say 625 households were assisted, 239 received legal uh, services. Um, but then in the memo, it says 500. I'm seeing a lot of different numbers. Can somebody walk me through uh, the numbers, what they look like in total? Yes, these are all different efforts um, and I'm happy to explain. Um, the 500 households that were served with legal services. So we have a number of contracts with Law Foundation. One of them was specific to the EHC um, with Law Foundation and Bay Area Legal for them to provide walk-in legal and virtual legal consultation, brief legal consultation five days a week, um, five, you know, three to five hours uh, a, a day. The, that 500 number represents those consultations. Um, we haven't done an analysis of what all those issues were. We don't always know what happens, but we do at least have the contact information to reach out and see what happened with those households, which is a project we have on our to-do list. The 48 number that you have mentioned, this is our eviction diversion and settlement program. This does not involve directly legal services. This is where our team is working with partners to identify tenants with uh, unlawful detainer actions involving non-payment where they had applied for rent relief. Maybe they didn't get enough, maybe they were denied, but there's sufficient um, documentation that we can go in, make sure that we wouldn't duplicate um, any funding, use some existing funding we have remaining to pay the back rent not only through March 31st, but what we can to, that has accrued since. And the, this is a voluntary program that involves the landlord, the tenant um, mediator sometimes to help negotiate. And this avoids forced evictions. And we also get arrearages and even when possible, some forward rent. And um, we're really grateful for the partnership with Destination Home and Sacred Heart, because when we can't use the federal funds in some circumstances, they are able to step in and fill the gap. So that's what those 48 cases are. It's separate from the Law Foundation walk-in services. Um, I, I'm happy to clarify, I, I'm not sure I got all your questions there. If there's something I, I, I can explain, um, I'm happy to, if I haven't gotten there. Yeah, and um, if we can follow up offline, I'm interested in, uh, the total stats. So we, we separate them by program, even though there are multiple providers. Um, and so like, for example, eviction diversion is mostly city staff with support um, from Destination Home and Sacred Heart, correct? Yes. Right. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm just, I'm interested in those numbers. And then um, 
I had asked this at council and didn't get the follow-up. So I'm gonna ask again, what are the case targets for our contracts with the Law Foundation and the Bay Area Legal Aid? Um, I don't have the, so there is the EHC. Um, I think they aren't quite meeting their, their targets under the, the walk-in and virtual legal services. Um, there is a consortium that does the renter's rights, um, the ARO tenant legal counseling and representation. I don't have those numbers in front of me for this report. Um, the targets I know for the coming year had to be lowered a bit, mostly due to capacity issues on with Law Foundation and their partners. They're not, they have lost lots of staff recently. It's a competitive market and difficult work. Um, and they had to increase their pay. So they lowered their targets a bit in their representation. So that's another, and then they also have a fair housing consortium contract to do um, fair housing education, discrimination investigation, and that sort of thing. And I don't believe those targets were lowered, but um, I, ha I haven't looked at those contracts in the last week or two, so I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but are happy to provide them. Okay, yeah, if you could uh, send those over, um, I'd appreciate that. Um, and and uh, you touched on something that I, uh, I think we need to pay more attention to as a city. I'm just going to drop it right here, which is uh, particularly on our work with shelters, um, uh, uh, providers at permanent housing uh, locations. Uh, we really need to look at pay for frontline staff um, uh, because this is an issue that we're seeing everywhere, even with our own city staff. Uh, but at some point, we really need to look at contracts in relation to pay, particularly on uh, those that are serving, that are out on the front lines, that are serving clients that are out at site. So I'll, I'll just leave that right here because that's not the point of today, but it is something that we should be talking more about um, as a city. And I'll, I'll be happy to bring that up to city council at some point in the future. Um, I had a, another question in terms of um, the, the diversion program, that's voluntary. Um, so for example, one of the um, landlords in my district tried to raise the rent 17 and a half percent, very low income neighborhood. Um, you know, they're not, they're not, they're unique, I think in the amount, but um, not necessarily in, in the fact that I think a lot of folks would be surprised uh, the mom and pop landlords aren't necessarily doing this, but the corporate landlords are. Um, what are we doing for those landlords that don't volunteer for mediation? How are we tracking those trends and how are we addressing um, deeper issues that may involve digging in a little bit deeper to see what's going on? Um, tr uh, trends in terms of rent increases or trends in terms of Evictions, Eviction. rent increases, and drastic rent increases are also a way of of moving people out as well, right? So there are current laws in place. Um, I believe the even if the local the ARO does not apply to the property, it's possible that a the Tenant Protection Act, the state law that passed uh, at the end of 2019, does uh, apply, and in that case. Unfortunately, the maximum rent cap under that law now is 10%. Um, in addition to that, I believe we still have the anti-price gouging um, order in place at the state level, which should cap rents at 10%. Um, I would encourage any corporate landlord or is, if, if tenants are seeing rent increases that high to let our department know and send us a copy because if we see patterns of it, we can see if we have any recourse as a city under the price gouging or at least try to work with the landlords directly. Um, but it's really important that we see those notices um, so we know where it's happening and, and um, what's happening. Unfortunately, um, people are still unable to pay rent. And this was a problem before the pandemic and it's only been exacerbated. And we are seeing a dramatic increase in the number of 
non-payment of rent notices sent um, submitted to the the rent stabilization program pursuant to the tenant protection ordinance. This is not even a picture citywide. This is only the covered properties or that are required to do so. Um, and we have a process of sending out mailers when we get these notices because we have the con we can send um, multilingual mailers about where to get assistance. But if these if if the tenant's not able to pay the rent, there's only so much that can be done. Um, legal representation or mediation can help extend a move out date or work out a payment plan. And we can encourage people to go those avenues. Legal aid only has so much capacity. They have to, you know, for who they can actually represent, they have to triage and figure out where the greatest need is. Um, and mediation is voluntary. So if the rent amounts are legal, um, there's, there's not much recourse for the tenant. And I, it's, um, we're trying to figure out creative ways so we at least catch people who are at the precipice. If there is a UD filed, we're trying to get them at all spots. If we're, we get UDs filed with us, we're reaching out to those tenants to get them to file an answer. Because we know that once people file an answer, um, when I say answer a response filing to the eviction lawsuit, um, they, and are engaged in the process, their outcomes are a lot better. The biggest problem is if people don't respond in that five day window and get a default judgment. So we're targeting our, for what we do have control over is to build trust in the community, have them call us if they get any kind of notice or an unlawful detainer so we can connect them to the right resources to get engaged in the process. Once that response is on file, if we can get the, the mediator information to them, they can start that process early. It's also their day of court. Um, the UD commissioner really strongly encourages all parties there to try to work it out with a mediator in the hallway. If um, Law Foundation is on site, at least during the busiest day, so they are there at least the day of to try and advocate for tenants. And when there isn't Law Foundation, the mediators are neutrals, but they are working to even the playing field and give the tenants some control over the outcome. So I think I, I'm just trying to show that the non Yeah, I, I issue, understand. Yeah, I do. Can't fix. <laughs> I, I understand. And, and I think, um, I think, uh, so in the case of the 17 and a half percent, it was the city attorney's office that, you know, uh, got involved. I, there was, a uh, another, uh, another situation in district five where the same landlord raised it. Uh, 15 percent um you know they have legal counsel uh the residents living in these uh developments don't have it um to even know to fight back right so um i'm, I'm bringing that up because we're going to be running into this more and more and a lot of folks um you know i think it, it's hard for you know good, honest people to, to understand that there are folks out there uh, raising rents um, in the double digits uh, in very low income communities as we're coming out of COVID. Um, and so I do think that there are some folks who are still continue to be very, very vulnerable. Um, and, uh, and I would like to see how we can um, so I'd like to get that information offline that I had asked for, because one of the things I'm really interested in is how we as a city um, oversee this as a whole and sort of collectively, I think we've been adding programs during COVID and I think we really need to look at this more holistically. Um, and I would uh, love to talk more about that offline. Lastly, last council last member, question. Yep, yep. Council last member, question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Th you, Thank you. Uh, you've exceeded the time and I've been very generous. So we need to wrap this up. Yep. Uh, so really quickly on the, um, the part where it says in the memo where it talks about all the tenants who, um, who are still trying to make ends meet. How are we working with Sacred Heart and Destination Home and other providers again to look at so many folks who 
were in need before COVID. And we have some real problems out there in our communities. People are struggling now. They're, it's not getting better. There are a lot of desperate families and desperate people out in the community. Um, how are we coming together in uh, sort of the, this post-state um, uh, uh, rental assistance? How are we as a community with the county and the city coming together there to meet those needs? Hi, council member, as far as the Reagan Henninger with the housing department, um, I will say we are in close partnership with the County Office of Supportive Housing and Destination Home on our homeless prevention system and expanding the capacity in that program. Um, we. I don't have the numbers in front of me of our expansion targets, um, but the city is um, investing more in homeless prevention thanks to Measure E. Um, we have now a steady source of income that we can contribute to homeless prevention. Um, so I would say the other piece is Destination Home and Sacred Heart have been very involved in our weekly eviction diversion clinic and our eviction diversion and settlement program. And uh, we are all three very interested and committed to keeping those programs going post COVID and um, I guess iterating as we go, how can we um, put more money into those programs? How can we continue to expand them and bring in more partners? But I would be happy to provide our homeless prevention system uh, goals to you when we also provide you our legal service contract uh, metrics and outcomes. Thank you. I'd be uh, interested in seeing that. We need to stay in the community um, because in page five of the memo talks about how folks, they need help doing this stuff. They need a place to go. They need people to, to talk to. And whether it's us or one of our partner providers, we need to continue to be out in the community. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands. Um, and uh, I just have one question. Um, and I've asked this, uh, but I wanted to know if you knew any anything in addition. I know that the, the county has pulled back on the diversion program um, and we talked about potentially because people have to return back to their regular roles isn't this something that they are going to invest and, and maybe pivot because the need is out there i i can't answer for the county but yeah. we continue to have um we uh regular meetings on this subject the county still uh, OSH's Office of Supportive Housing is still present at these meetings. Um, so we try to make sure we're all getting the same information and all seeing the trends and that we align our efforts accordingly. But I uh, can't speak to what uh, the county. Right. No, no. I, I'm, I'm asking in terms of when you speak with them and you have these conversations, are they pivoting? I mean, are they uh, going in a different direction because that's what the need of the community has been? or are they just drawing back because they don't have the resources i think they're um they could no longer participate in the weekly court program because you are right council member they had to they were using uh disaster service workers who oh. were redeployed to do this work uh, and had been redeployed for two years and they had to send those county workers back to their uh, their regular jobs. Uh, so it was not for lack of uh, interest or lack of commitment to the program. Mm -hmm. It was simply they had to make decisions about their workforce, mm -hmm. um, but they are still at the table in our regular um, planning and problem solving meetings and um, the eviction diversion and settlement program and our weekly clinics with the court uh, are definitely part of our long-term strategic planning with the county and destination home and sacred house 
Sacred Heart about how we keep the program going and not just keep it going, but again, how do we keep iterating and changing and expanding so we're able to meet even more need? Right. No, I know. And you've, you've all um, sur surpassed a, a lot of what we've expected you to do out there. Um, because you're working with all those folks who are actually, you know, facing the evictions and, and this must be uh, taking a toll on everyone. But um, I, I agree in, in some respects that uh, the need continues to be there. It doesn't go away, right? When people owe this money, have an eviction looming, or are going to have an, an eviction, um, are in the midst of it. I think it's a question maybe for, for policymakers or maybe for the executive's um, office uh, to answer um, as we are going to be the ones holding the bag. And and then we're going to be the ones finding trying to find the resources to substitute whatever um, the county was doing previously. Um, and as we all have learned that we can't do it ourselves, right? We just can't. Um, and I heard you loud and clear. You were, you know, you're going to increase some of, or you're going to hope to increase some of these investments. Um, that still um, makes it seem like we are taking on a, a heavier role. So, so, anyways, I I know there's a lot to that. We can unpack it later. We can have an offline conversation. Um, I'm willing to be helpful if if I can be. Um, but uh, I just wanted to end with uh, thanking you. I know that our school district did a, just an amazing job. I, my daughter uh, attended Franklin McKinley School District for a really short period of time um, and uh, just really appreciated uh, the way that they serve just holistically the families. I got a chance to actually experience that. Um, and so that was just amazing what they do with, with their families. But I'm also very amazed at what you all do on the other side to help us uh, get there, right? Um, to make sure that the, uh, our community has these resources in the place-based, uh, very best practice, uh, proven uh, manner. And I, I know you have all been very considerate about our community. And so I just want to thank you for all the really great work and the people that are behind you that have done uh, the work as well. So thank you so much. Um, and I think that that is it. We don't have a motion. So if somebody could provide me with a motion. I move approval. Second. Second. Wonderful. Let's have a roll call. Jimenez. Yes. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. So we're going to move on to the Coyote Creek Trail Safety Pilot Project Status Report. This is item uh, D2. And we're going to give a chance to uh, have our Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services folks come down. Uh, to the box and, and present. Thank you. Excuse me? Oh my gosh, I just moved on. You're right. I'll strike that. Strike that from the record. I'm going to have the City Initiatives Roadmap Bill of Rights for Children and Youth Audit Report. And for those of you who are at home, that's D1. Uh, so I was moving along uh, in our agenda, uh, but we had skipped over our Bill of Rights um, audit, which I'm looking forward to and uh, appreciate. So good afternoon, Kilroy City Auditor. Uh, I'm here to present our audit of the Bill of Rights for Children and Youth, incorporating the Bill of Rights into planning can enhance services. I'm joined by Brittany Harvey from my office, who is the lead on the project. Also in the box are Laura Busto from the city manager's office, uh, Maria De Leon from Parks and Recreation Neighborhood Services, and Michelle Arnott from the library. Originally adopted by city council in 2010 and later revised by the San Jose Youth Commission in 2021, the Bill of Rights for Children and Youth serves as aspirational guidelines to demonstrate the importance of youth to the city of San Jose and to help San Jose youth receive the resources they need to succeed. 
The Bill of Rights outlines specific rights for children and youth in the areas of health, safety, education, fair employment, and others. In adopting the Bill of Rights, the City Council expressed the importance of the City using it as guidance when considering and developing programs and activities for the benefit of our youth. The original Bill of Rights was modeled after similar guidelines adopted by the State of California and the counties of Santa Clara and San Mateo. This audit was requested by Councilmember Reynos with the objective of reviewing the adherence to and implementation of the Bill of Rights for Children and Youth by City Departments. One last note, following the acceptance of the revised Bill of Rights, the City Council in the June 2021 budget process allocated funding for the administration to develop a Children and Youth Services Master Plan. The goal of this plan is to develop a citywide strategy to serve children and youth in San Jose. It's intended to provide guidance on policy priorities, investment, and alignment of programs to create an integrated cradle to career continuum of services. As this plan is still in development, we did not audit the current efforts to develop the master plan, but focused on the adherence to and implementation of the Bill of Rights for children and youth as noted earlier. We had two findings. The first finding was that current city programs address many of the elements of the Bill of Rights. The city has many programs and services, both directly serving children and youth and indirectly. We found the city spent at least $36 million on programs directly focused on children and youth in fiscal year 2020, 2021. This included $15.8 million in programs under the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force and related programs, and over $4 million in literacy, education, and family learning. Additionally, the city invests in services that indirectly support children, youth, and families. Examples include housing services, infrastructure improvements, public safety programs, parks, general library expenditures, among others. The exhibit on the right of the slide shows a summary of PRNS for Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services programs and library locations by council district. Many of the city's programs address articles in the Bill of Rights. However, there is variability in the extent to which the city is currently addressing each element outlined in the Bill of Rights. In some cases, the city relies on partnerships or coordinates with other entities such as the county or community-based organizations. In other cases, the city has relied on COVID-19 relief funding, which is time limited and could result in a future gap in service. The second finding is that the Bill of Rights framework should be used to, infirm, to inform the Children Youth Services Master Plan. We found the city currently does not have a centralized inventory of all city provided programs for children and youth. Compiling and maintaining an inventory using the Bill of Rights framework can help staff and residents understand, better understand where there may be service gaps and what offerings the city has. It can also be a useful ongoing resource for staff to be aware of other city offerings outside of their department. An inventory can also help inform the city's current equity initiatives around children and youth services. The Bill of Rights framework can also help the master plan process to identify desired outcomes and help the city ensure it is having the impact it intends to. Multiple city programs currently modern pro mo monitor progress towards program level outcomes. The slide shows different ways city programs measure success, and the city can lean on these and other tools within the city as it develops metrics and means of measuring progress for the children youth master plan. In addition, other jurisdictions, such as Oakland and Santa Clara County, monitor population data to help understand the impacts of their programs. We've included examples in the report and in the appendices, and these are also ways the city can measure impact of its services. We had two recommendations in the report. In developing the Children Youth Services Master Plan, the city should identify a process and resources to develop and maintain an inventory of children and youth programs. This can help document gaps in services and enhance equity and accessibility in services across the city. Define and report on metrics and assess overall progress toward outcomes identified in the Bill of Rights. This may, these may require coordination with outside partners, such as the local school district or the county, if necessary. We'd like to thank the San Jose Public Library, the Department of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services, the City Manager's Office, and the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs for their time, insight, and cooperation during the audit process. I ask you to accept the report and cross-reference to the September 27th City Council meeting, and I'll turn it over to the administration for their response. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Brittany, we'd like to thank uh, the auditor's office uh, for this audit. Uh, as you'll mention, uh, 
like to re really especially thank uh, the library who oversees the Youth Commission, as well as uh, uh, Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. Um, just for sake of time, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and you know provide the overarching kind of response. Uh, there's two recommendations. Uh, the administration has greenlit both those recommendations. Um, uh, we, we really think that um, we, we have a great opportunity here. We, we recently just launched the uh, development of a children and youth master plan. And uh, Chair Dennis, I think it's, uh, it's also uh, thanks to you as well uh, in terms of your work, in terms of pushing a lot of the Bill of Rights uh, issue. Uh, this kind of goes back to uh, kind of working with the Youth Commission back in April of 2021 to kind of really resurrect uh, the Bill of Rights and then at that time also adding to additional Bill of Rights uh, to this work. At that time, uh, the council resolution basically uh, approved a set of aspirational uh, goals. I think the opportunity that we have in front of us is to really move from aspiration to implementation. Uh, and that's really what uh, we see here. And so uh, we, we are definitely good with, with um, the the recommendations one and two. The first recommendation uh, primarily focuses around operationalizing this work. And then the second uh, recommendation deals uh, largely with how we measure uh, performance, how we measure, how we move the needle uh, on this issue. Uh, both are in line with the process that we've laid out around the Children and Youth Master Plan. Um, and so I think we are good to go and we are set for, uh, for success. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you for any questions. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to the public before I move to my colleagues. Is there any speakers? Yes, we have one Zoom speaker, Blair Beekman. Please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this report. Uh, I, at Rules in Open Government, it sits at... Uh, you know, each month uh, during the uh, monthly uh, auditor's report at Rules and Open Government, uh, you can find this uh, report is being worked on. And I've always been interested in what it's about. I can now refer to this item today and uh, see what you're doing. And it sounds interesting. And uh, thank you for your work. That was the final speaker. Back to you. Great. I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to just ask a couple of questions, and if my colleagues have any, please let me know. Okay, so I'm going to uh, just really, first of all, thank you for the audit and for prioritizing this. I know you have a lot of work, uh, plenty of work, and so that you prioritized and, and made sure that this got done, um, it was just absolutely helpful and very strategic in uh, this parallel process that's happening that Angel just mentioned with our child and youth master plan and in the hopes that we can create a system that has a continuum of services that really makes sense for our children and for our youth that it's not a one-time program um, experience but really allows our our kiddos to um, move and progress and learn and grow um, within the city of San Jose and what we do, right? And so it was re it's really important for us to um, adhere to the Bill of Rights. Um, and, and like, you're, you, this is probably the best audit ever because uh, you only have two findings. And um, when, when was the last time that, that this happened, Joe? It happens now and then. It happens. Okay. <laughs> well, well, listen, I'm, I'm over the moon with this. Um, and so I want to thank you and, and your office, the city auditor's office, uh, Brittany, Harvey, um, am I missing? Mar Marissa Lynn? Marisa. M Marisa Lynn, yeah. Mar Marisa. Um, uh, for just this really important audit. Um, and adding it to the work plan, like I said, this is uh, this is what we're doing in terms of developing systems to work with one another and, and helping pivot, right? Sometimes we use an audit, sometimes we're looking at um, uh, procedures or, or taking a look at how we interact with our public. And so 
it's important to me um as you all know i've I've had this family friendly initiative um that that my colleagues supported and prioritized a couple of years ago and within that you know we started with safe parking for families we had a family friendly uh, uh facilities we finally got um diaper changing stations in in all of our uh in the city hall for crying out loud right in city hall we sometimes we don't think about that but we want to make sure that we're welcoming and um, and and uh, making it as easy as we can for our families to visit, not only just City Hall, but the parks and the community centers and libraries and all that. Um, and I know that it, we are in the process of also doing uh, some um, breastfeeding pods in some of our libraries where there's a high use for for our younger children. And so that's also, it's uh, these lactation pods that are, are, I just can't wait to see them. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to use them. My daughter's already seven, but um, there's gonna be a lot of families. This is gonna facilitate, because this is what happens when you're a mom of a young kid. You have to, if you don't wanna breastfeed in, in public, then you have to go to your car and get in and get out is just so complicated and for a mom who wants to stay connected with our community it's so important to just make it as convenient as we can um we also had a lot of our um, scholarships this summer and i'm just going through a little bit of the 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 our our journey um not only just to, you you know this journey because you <laughs> we've walked hand in hand um, but I'm sharing this also with our audience um, who at home who uh, hasn't uh, maybe put all of these things together, but our scholarships were a way uh, to facilitate after school and um, learning and, of course, a safe place for our children. As we all know that um, sexual assault is, 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 um, has a really big uh, impact in our children under the age of 13 and so that was also important for us to do and not only that but just to keep parents in in um at work and employed and um and making sure that there's housing support um and of course you know our our ten and a half million that we received in arpa funding um in november it just this is all coming together really lovely and and i'm i'm sharing this with you joe because i know that that um, you go through a lot of audits. Um, this one ha this one happens to be very meaningful um, because it's not only um, auditing our services uh, based on the rights of our children and our youth, um, but it's also uh, given us a, an opportunity to stop and take a look. What what are our systems doing, and how can we continue to improve that? Um, because systems are meant to just keep going. Right, and those cycle whatever they are meant to produce. And if we don't change something, when change a part of that cog, it's going to continue to produce the same thing. So we want to make sure that that we have different um, outcomes for our children, and that we're we're able to do this by being very strategic, and especially post pandemic, as we've heard. Um, earlier with our housing needs, so we, it, this is post pandemic, but people continue to have a lot, um, just a layered array of needs. And so our family friendly um, work plan uh, should be reporting back soon to um, NSC. And that actually came from, we had a child and, uh, and youth well-being strategic plan, and we updated that uh, to come back. Um, and so I know that this has been a whole trajectory of work and um, a lot of dedication. And so I just wanna thank the staff for, for doing uh, their part to bring us closer. This is, this is um, culminating in, in, in what we're starting off and, and Angel Rios and Laura have uh, um, had a great role in their leadership in making sure that the child and youth master plan that got up and running. Uh, you're very considerate with the, with your partners and, and bringing those folks in and having that level of investment so that we can 
not only have a continuum of services within the city of San Jose, but beyond the city of San Jose, because we can't fill those spots that we may have there, right? We, we need to bring those partners in um, because we can't be everything to um, everyone and we don't have to. We don't have to, that's why we have these partnerships. And so anyways, I, I just wanted to take a moment to to go through some of that and to make sure that it, um, that all the dots are kind of connected. The work around sexual assault, this is something very much braided into all of this because we recognize that there's a lot of child um, uh, molestations. And so we know that there's a lot of overcrowding at homes and this is a crime of opportunity. And usually it's a, uh, of a person that um, that child or youth already know. And so we, we have to make sure that we connect all these dots. And this for me um, really allowed uh, to that to happen. Here's my question, I'm going over my time. I see you, Council Member Esparza. I'll get to you in just a second. Um, no, 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 I'll, I'll be less than a minute. I'm good. <laughs> All right. So we will, um, if you, we can go to page 19. So page 19 had all the community center hubs um, that had all the, the programs that were offered, right? Either camps or dance or education, teen therapeutic recreation. And this covers just the year of 2021, correct, Joe? Correct. Right. So th this is my question, and this is where I think we need to continue to take a look at how we um, decide who, who gets what. Uh, and this is a question more really for, for Angel, um, Joe. Uh, and, and maybe you, you can provide some insight into this, but my question is that if we are focused this is post pandemic. We know that we are supposed to be responding to the most neediest of our communities. Yet Willow Glen and Almaden and Camden have the top three in terms of camps, in terms of dance, in terms of um, just the variety of services. So how did how did we pivot if how are we pivoting? Because this to me the, um, looks like we might be continuing to do some of the same things. Yeah, yeah, Chair Adenis, um, let, let me just start by saying we have definitely pivoted. So this is a snapshot moment in time, uh, 2021. Uh, this is pre-ARP dollars. This is also pre more intentional pivot around um, continued focus on vulnerable communities. I think at that time, you know, th this graph right here pretty much captured th those centers that quite frankly were just more nimble and, and able to kind of get up and running and in, in a shorter amount of time. If we were to run these numbers again, my guess would be, uh, my, my strong guess would be that it would look really different, uh, uh, mainly because when you take a look at all the recent efforts, especially over the last nine months, uh, we, we, they, they've primarily been focused on neighborhoods that are uh, in crisis, neighborhoods most in need, neighborhoods that have been most impacted by the pandemic, um, and, and, and that trajectory will continue into the future. And that's also one of the kind of the un, un, undergirding kind of uh, principles with the Children and Youth Master Plan is that we want to take a citywide approach to serving children and youth with a very high focus and priority focus on vulnerable communities and kids that need uh, that, that additional assistance. And so um, I, I think it's safe to say that that's just a snapshot that is uh, definitely outdated and would look different uh, when we run that today. Thank you for, for saying that. Thank you for, for addressing that because I, that caused me some concern. Um, and because this is 2021, this is already, we were already pivoting, right? We were already providing the scholarships. We were already doing some of the really good work. And so I just, it looks different than what, from what we've discussed. Maria, did you? Yeah. So, um, so we agree that there are some disparities there and that that was a snapshot in time. So some of the things that staff is doing to eliminate some of the disparities, especially uh, agreeing with what Angel said, we're focusing in high need areas. Um, so for example, Mayfair, right? Mm -hmm. We're developing a master plan that'll help increase programs and services. We replaced some key leadership positions there with some of our star employees who specialize and working with vulnerable populations and uh, increasing participation levels. 
We have also increased our outreach efforts that include the off-site program outreach, recruitment, and scholarship registrations. For example, we went to Valley Palm Apartments and also at some of the Project Hope site events and registered folks right there and then with oh, our laptop. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah, and um, with the scholarships being 100% right now, we've greatly increased our camp uh, participation, our rock participation, our leisure classes, and our preschool. And I think the most important thing now is that we're, we're doing, is we're excited about, is um, we're going to be conducting a community survey, asking the community exactly what they want to see out of that community center. And so as, I know I'm missing a few things, but as a result, Mm -hmm. At Mayfair, we've increased uh, programs and, and participation levels 38% since the beginning of, uh, since pre-pandemic. Right. And we just got started. Right, right. So we, we're mindful of that. We're mindful of the audit results, and we're taking steps to address it. Wonderful. Um, if, I, if I had one thing, I just want to pivot back to the, you know, the recommendations. So I, I paraphrase the recommendations in the presentation, but I just wanted to, circle back to the specific language in the recommendation it's part 1b on page 21. the language is continue to enhance equity and service delivery by developing citywide procedures and monitoring mechanisms to increase accessibility to children and youth programs in underserved areas so we were a bit more specific about what we use this data for and, and this was what we provided this was an example of how you use the data to identify these service gaps and where where services may be needed in different areas to create that uh, to, to enhance that equity and service delivery. So that I just wanted to just flesh out the recommendation a little bit because that was kind of the purpose behind bringing some of this information into the audit report. Thank you, Joe. Thank you uh, for doing that. Those are the questions I have, but I just want to uh, once again um, end this with, with a lot of gratitude because I am absolutely grateful not only to uh, you, Joe, for uh, completing the audit, but all of the work that I just mentioned um, that represents a lot of our KRNS, our library folks, are just um, really good, wonderful partners out there. So I, I just want to say, uh, take this moment to say thank you. Thank you for, for bringing us to this point, um, which is going to be, for me, I think very pivotal so that we can that, really change those social determinants for our, our children and our youth and change their path um, so, that, so that we can see a lot more success um, in some of these vulnerable communities okay so that um do i have a oh council member as far as i was going to ask for a motion but i forgot oh. about you uh, sorry go ahead yeah. no i i just wanted to uh first off you know you mentioned gratitude i wanted to actually call you out and thank um thank you council member Rennes, for submitting this to the auditor um out of the uh, the, your work for children and youth. And then we've seen over the past two and a half years how important um, it really has been to really reach out to the whole family. Um, and we've seen how life-saving this work um, really is. Um, so I just wanted to do that and then make a motion to, ex I'll move to accept the report. Second. Wonderful, thank you so much and thank you for that. Um, let's uh, have a roll call. Chair, Chair before oh. you oh. vote, I, I just do also want to clarify that this is a cross-reference also to the September oh. 27th uh, right. City Council meeting. Right, yes, December 27th. Can you include that in your motion? Yes, and I'll include cross-referencing cross -referencing this, I can't talk, uh, to the meeting, December 27th. Wonderful. Okay, now we can do a roll call. Ten minutes. Chair, sorry, Chair? Yes. It's Carrasco. Can I, I, I had my hand raised. Oh, I'm, I checked. I, I apologize, Council Member Carrasco. I didn't see your, your thank you for, for, for speaking up. I apologize about that. Yes, go ahead. Council Member, did you want to speak? Hello? Yes. Yeah, I, I, yes. Uh, my really super bad. Um, I just, wanted, uh, I also wanted to extend my gratitude to, uh, to Joe and his team. Uh, but also my uh, really appreciation for been involved in making sure that our uh, our kiddos in the city of San Jose uh, have uh, access to opportunities, uh, but especially when we're talking about vulnerable communities and, and those impacted by COVID. 
council member, your your um, comments are coming in and out. To just emphasize, um, is, council uh, member, I'm yeah. so sorry. Your your comments are coming in and out. I don't know if you. Um, we yeah, haven't heard the last like 30 seconds, maybe. No, it was such a great speech. You know, <laughs> I was like, she's trying to make me cry. She's trying to make us all cry in this uh, committee. <laughs> no, so I, I, I just, try. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let's, let's see if I can just get this out real quick. Okay. I, I wanted to ask specifically uh, to Angel and to Maria. Uh, as you know, I've been very concerned about the programming and the services and access to our our. Uh, our folks, uh, our family seniors, but in this case, our children uh, on the east side of San Jose, uh, such as Mayfair. And so one thing is to have an audit that comes in, takes a look at it, gives us a snapshot, and then we can give some feedback. What are you, what are you putting in place so that you can do self audit and make sure that you're providing the kinds of programs that are at, uh, on par with uh, communities like, uh, like Willow Glen, or Almaden Valley, uh, or the Rose Garden area, you know, areas that we saw uh, had uh, entirely different types of programs than the ones offered on the east side of San Jose. Thank you for your question. Um, we've increased, uh, we've had several discussions and meetings regarding this, and, and you are right, there is disparities in programs and services and classes. And so what we started doing is reaching out to our leisure class instructor and instructors and, re and place them the type of services that we get in Almaden and in Berryessa or Evergreen. And we've placed them out at uh, Mayfair so that the community can have access to those same services. We're not only doing that for our leisure classes, but for our seniors and our, our teens as well. And the goal is, is that Although it can happen overnight, our goal is to do this every single season, every single activity guide, that we provide more and more and more services out of uh, uh, community centers in high need areas such as Mayfair, so that we're that they're robust, that we're busting out at the seams. That's that's what our goal is to do that. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question that I'm asking. Council member, we missed your question. Member to suddenly point something out that's happening in their district, but rather it's something that's built into your system so that, uh, you know, sounds and whistles go off uh, as you're programming and, and you realize, uh oh, you know, we're providing uh, robotics at uh, Almaden Valley and we're providing uh, storytelling at uh at mayfair you know we're providing zumba and tai chi whereas we're providing you know a virtual coffee at mayfair and so i want to make sure that there's something that's built in so that it self-regulates you regardless of who's in the leadership position and who's uh, on your team because staff comes and goes and leadership changes uh so what what are you building in to ensure that 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 we don't see these disparities, especially moving budget, looking at our departments and making sure that we're looking at everything with the lens equity. And when you look at those programs, it was uh, it was really shortchanging vulnerable communities who needed the most. So the question is very specific: What are you doing to build into your system uh, something that uh, is self-regulating and that uh, sounds off the alarms when when that doesn't take place? We're building in periodic assessments, whether it's uh, quarterly or two times a year, to ensure that there is equity amongst our programs. In addition to that, uh, I mentioned that we're having a community survey as well as not only self-assessment of ourselves and our programs and the services that provide, but also getting the community's feedback on the programs and services that they'd like. And we're going to incorporate them in the community center. So not only it's self-assessment, but also getting feedback from the community. Are we, are we doing well? Are we providing the right services? And make it the necessary pivots and changes to address them. And council member, the other thing I would add to that is, uh, and, and again, going back to the children and youth master plan, you know, we're gonna be incorporating an equity lens to that work. And so as we develop strategic goals 
objectives, OKRs uh, tied to that work, it's gonna be informed by this equity lens uh, and we'll be able to codify that strategy and approach in the way we do uh, business as a city, as well as what we even expect our partners that receive city funding to do with those funds. And so I think we're gonna have an opportunity to really codify this approach and so that it's not hit and miss and it's not determined by you know, what, what staff understand this and what staff don't, but, but it actually gets uh, operationalized in our standard operating procedures. And that's, that's the ultimate goal is to make sure that we do this with, with good discipline and intent um, going forward. Uh, th thank you, Maria, and thank you, Angel. That's uh, music to my ears. Uh, again, uh, we should almost have this on autopilot, right? Where uh, regardless of who's uh, at the helm, that, uh, that this always gets looked at and we make sure that, uh, that our kiddos on, in vulnerable communities get, uh, get the kind of programming that we've seen in other parts of the city. So thank you so much for your work. Again, thank you to the entire team uh, as well as to Joe's team. And, and I wanna echo uh, my gratitude to council member Arenas. You've been a, a fierce uh, warrior when it comes to uh, families and children and making sure that, uh, that none of our families, regardless of age or uh, geographic location, but that they are all well served. Uh, so I wanna thank you for that. Well, it takes one to know one. So right back at you. Thank you. And so we are going to do roll call now for that vote. Jimenez? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Carrasco? Aye. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. What? Wonderful. So now we are going to move on to our last item. This is our Coyote Creek Trail Safety Pilot Project status report. This is item D2 on the agenda and we're going to have our parks recreation neighborhood services and our representatives from our police department joining us today welcome everyone good afternoon chair members of the committee my name is avi otam and i'm the deputy director of parks and parks recreation and neighborhood services i'm joined today by captain brian spears of the san jose police department and uh, parks manager Manny Cota, uh, who oversees our parks and trails uh, for much of South and Southeast San Jose, from uh, William Street Park on South, and including some uh, parks in Southern District 5 and most of the parks in Council District 8. We're here today. Clicker to work. We're here today to present an update on the Coyote Creek Trail Safety Pilot. During trail planning, we heard community feedback and concerns about safety uh, from a variety of uh, issues, including potential encampments, glass and other obstacles, and, and recently vehicles. Staff was directed by the city council to provide quarterly updates on trail safety efforts and to continue, continue partnering with the police department in September 2020 as part of the construction contract award. We gave a first update in April after the opening of the Coyote Creek Trail from William to Phelan and on early activity in this pilot. As a quick reminder, this trail is one of the longest multi-use trail systems in the South Bay region. The new segment brought us two miles closer to our 100 mile trail network goal. And this multi-jurisdictional trail links parks, schools, jobs, shopping, and new affordable housing along Center Road. The missing link on a contiguous Coyote Creek Trail is a final segment between Phelan and Tully. This segment has been fully designed and the city is working to acquire the final piece of land needed to construct the long awaited community asset. Um, we continue as staff to, to communicate with that property owner and are aiming towards having that operational in 2025. This trail, Coyote Creek Trail is also slated for vehicle deterrence. The planning and design work has started. Once the final trail segment is built and interconnects with other trails, Trail user activation will likely increase and we can provide even more services and connectivity. Based on our annual trail counts and survey results from last fall, the Coyote Creek Trail has had the largest increase of trail users when compared to the prior year. And we expect to see much the same next week when we do our 2022 trail count and survey. With that said, we'd like to highlight two 
give uh, updates on two exciting partnerships that have developed uh, for Coyote Creek Trail Safety. Good afternoon, everyone. The San Jose Police Department continues to staff this uh, with bicycle officers seven days a week uh, from 8 a.m. 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. Uh, with the collaboration of the uh, with our youth, um, which is is actually gaining momentum. It started with uh, you know a, a, a pulling and shoving, but now it's become a, a fun project uh, for the group. Next slide. When it comes to to stats, first and foremost, the police department wants to make sure that we're providing information from more of a non-enforcement perspective, making sure that we are making contact with individuals who are uh, utilizing and uh, enjoying the trail. Uh, at times, we do have contacts with our unhoused and offer uh, a variety of assistance and information. Uh, criminal citations are, in fact, uh, utilized. They are from an infraction perspective, uh, meaning these have been open containers, uh, use of narcotics, uh, dumping, those types of things. The vehicle impounds are vehicles that have been either A, reported stolen and dumped on the trail, and or B, uh, obviously abandoned and, and dumped uh, for miscellaneous reasons. Warrant arrest, uh, those are just citations that are issued, uh, updating promise to appears with very few uh, but obvious arrests that, that need to take place. Uh, and if we come across the parking citations, we will exercise that discretion just as well. And that's it from the put from the PD side. Good afternoon. Oh, excuse me. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Committee man members. Um, Manny Cotto, Park Manager for Parks, Recreation, and Everyday Services. Um, the Trail Safety Pilot Program enlisted the San Jose Conservation Corps to serve as the eyes on the trail. The Conservation Corps Trail Safety Team is comprised of a patrol team on bikes that resolve and report most issues, and then also a trail strike team, which would be able to follow up on more intense concerns. Um, <clears throat> any concerns beyond the trail safety team capabilities would then be reported and resolved by the appropriate partner within the city of San Jose. Next slide. <clears throat> the trail safety team's responsibilities included reporting trail emergencies by calling 911, um, calling San Jose Fire Department directly, and any non-emergency issues they would report to either uh, Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Service staff, the Beautify San Jose, Homeless Concerns, or uh, directly to the park rangers. The trail safety team performs light landscaping and maintenance, and usually items that could be dealt with within 20 minutes. The San Jose Conservation Corps strike team would then be able to follow up on issues beyond the safety patrol scope like any large repair or maintenance issues that the strike team couldn't resolve would then be forwarded to ARNS stakeholders or for resolution. In addition, San Jose Conservation Corps would be able to provide information to trail users. And, and, in, and in addition, uh, San Jose Conservation Corps participants would gain insight and practical experience working with city government process. Here depicts um, quite a few uh, pictures and a, a web app that we currently are working on. Um, so currently, San Jose Conservation Corps is utilizing this web app to track and geolocate all the service concerns. Um, <clears throat> some of the identified items that were are shown here up on the top left are the pile of debris. Uh, on the bottom left is accumulated litter that is bagged and um, stacked for the strike team to pick up. And then, um, like, for example, fence incursions as shown on the bottom picture um, would be followed up by the strike team and or reported uh, to PRNS staff. Uh, the middle picture is the web app uh, capture uh, that shows the individual concerns and where they were located. And the legend on the right actually identifies the number of uh, concerns and the color coordinated with the web app.
So we currently are showing up some program challenges and realize that coordination has suffered. Um, we are currently in process of setting up bi-weekly, monthly, and quarterly meetings with the various stakeholders and San Jose Conservation Corps staff. With these meetings, we will be able to verify that the trail safety pilot program will have reliable data and ensure that it meets the goals previously set forth. We hope to continue to explore funding opportunities for sustainable trail maintenance safety, um, which is currently funded on a one-time basis. Um, next steps of the trail safety pilot will be focused on verifying and collecting data and deploying concerns to the appropriate partner for resolution. We plan to continue to meet and communicate with partners on a regular basis and collaborate and identify training opportunities such as potential partnerships, including activation events with Ki Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful and the Audubon Society. We plan to continue to monitor vegetation, re reduce weeds, fire load, and line of sight issues to increase the sense of safety safety for all trail users. So this concludes our staff presentation. Um, we recommend that the committee accept this report and um, we recommend that committee direct staff to return on an annual report in the fall of 2023. And um, we are here available for committee questions or comments. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm gonna uh, ask for public comment first. We have one speaker with their hand raised, uh, caller 8755, please go ahead. Hi, this is Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. It sounds like there's a, a good amount of care for how to address this issue. It's a bit tender. Uh, but I guess, you know, um, I, I, you know, good practices hopefully can help this item. I know the work that I do with uh, technology, uh, surveillance technology and data collection that will be possibly a part of this work. To, to want to offer open public policies to the public on this item can maybe be of help with how to address a more equal balance of how, of how to deal with trail issues. Um, a reminder, uh, I mean, for the public to have a more equal balance with, with, with trail issues. So they feel they can have a say in this process as well. And I, I can give them a bit of a, a word we're using these days is leverage and feel so they're not overwhelmed by the situation that they can actually ask questions to yourselves as, as city government about, you know, the policies of, of, of tech within the trail system. And that can start uh, a, a conversation, hopefully. Uh, it can be of help anyway. A reminder that um, the city of Davis up by Sacramento has done some really awesome, great work on uh, their wildlife trail uh, policies uh, with technology. And uh, the, the idea is to be open, clear, and transparent, and for all sides to want to talk about that in San Jose with this sort of issue can really be uh, helpful in how, uh, how to negotiate conversation. Uh, good luck, it, it is a, a bit of a tough conversation, but it's actually an honest conversation about uh, democracy and our practices of a community. Thank you. Liz Holt. Mute. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Liz Holtz. Um, I do TNR trapping of cats and uh, rescue work in San Jose. And as I'm sure most of you are probably aware, we have a large issue with cats. Um, and in particularly along the Coyote Creek Trail, there are a lot of cats and dogs and other animals that are kept as pets by members of the com uh, homeless community in those areas. There's also a lot of animals that get abandoned into the park in those areas. Um, I know people who work uh, going out feeding the animals, trying to get uh, the kittens and get them into rescue, trying to make sure that they're safe. 
I would like to see as part of this project that that be taken into consideration. These animals that are out there um, that are not being cared for, that are being dumped uh, on the trail need to be handled, whether that's by feeders, whether that's by active TNR uh, program um, that I don't see happening in any of the parks in San Jose. Um, you know, it's an issue and it needs to be addressed. And I hope that you will consider that as part of what you're looking to do in cleaning up that entire area. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Council Member Sparza. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, start off by uh, thanking our partners, uh, thanking the Water District um, uh, for their partnership on the Trail Patrol for this. Um, and this really was a pilot. Um, and so, uh, you know, they've uh, committed to uh, also support the Guadalupe uh, Trail Patrol. And um, uh, we're having some discussions uh, on how we can keep that going. So I just wanted to uh, share that and say thank you to the Water District for that. I also wanted to thank um, the Conservation Corps for their partnership on this. You know, this was a, a wild idea way back in 2019 to talk about this. Um, so it was super exciting when we were able to open the trail in November uh, with all of these partnerships and all of these things uh, happen. And, and I have seen, uh, you know, I drive past that area every day. And so I have seen the Conservation Corps out and I wanted to thank you and the Conservation Corps for working through those issues to ensure that um, that work gets done, uh, you know, even with uh, the turnover and those issues get figured out. I do think that having that visible presence has been really important. And, and you know, cause I've been out there, it's a bunch of kids, they're very outgoing. They say hello to folks. Um, uh, it's good. It, it's good and something that should continue. And lastly, I wanted to thank, um, I wanted to thank our own team, uh, all the partners, um, Avi, uh, John Angel, who was in the meetings in 2019. Um, and, uh, and actually we went through, uh, it started with police chief Garcia and then chief Mata, uh, uh, made sure that this got off the ground. And so I just wanted to thank everybody for that. Um, and then uh, wanted to just uh, emphasize, I, it was in the report, but I just wanted to emphasize that this, these partnerships are really to set the stage for all the activations because the success is having people use this trail patrol um, and uh, would love to see more activations. And I did want to just say with the Tully Night Market at the Tully Ball Fields, one of the uh, interesting things uh, is seeing all the folks come out of the trail on their scooters and bicycles um, and take the trail uh, to the night market. And so that's been very exciting to see. Definitely want more of that. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so just I'm very excited. I would like to see this uh, continue to be nurtured and grow because I think there are many aspects, as you mentioned, from the design, from the design uh, to the activations, to the maintenance, to the PD, all of these things together um, are really the package uh, that make this work a success. So with that, I'd like to move to accept the report. I'll go ahead and second. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, about the criminal citations. Um, I saw that there was an increase. I forgot what page that was on. It was in the month of uh, July, Council. Uh, page, page five. Page five. So on page five, it has the Trail Patrol Program SJPD service deliverables. Um, and it just looks like, uh, you know, the, it, it varies a little bit, um, but June, July, I'm guessing because there's an increase of people there. Increase in, in as well as, uh, you know, summertime students are out. Uh -huh. So those are some of the contacts. 
uh, but just the the overall increase just because of the weather change. And and you said what kind of criminal citations um, are they receiving? Infractions, open containers. Oh, open um, containers. Jeez. You know, the use of uh, marijuana, drugs on the trail, things like that. Th those are the main two. The primary, correct. Okay. So no, um, the, it's not like the um, the arrests were coming from maybe some of the interactions from the citations or, it, you know, do you check folks and see if they have the warrant out? I was surprised just to see how many warrants and that's warrant a, arrests. And that's a, a contribution to some of the, you know, when this project started, some of the unhoused that were looking for additional housing. Uh, so instead of trying to force or, or transport to jail, these are citations of a promise to appear on a new court date. So that that's really the where, where you're seeing that. Where once one area is, is uh, cleaned up by you know beautify San Jose, we now have an influx, and that's going to continue as we move around. So we'll see a spike, mm. and then we'll see a reduction. Okay, got it, got it. Okay. Um, well, this was very really helpful to see what what those issues were. The graph was actually very. Helpful. I know that uh, I think I saw that the biggest one of the biggest concerns or at least um, in represent uh, it was represented by red dots and that was like the, the cleanliness and so we it's no secret we know right um, I'm glad that there's this kind of activation that is happening and um, and the uh, conservation core is contributing to to that right when people see other people having a good time or just even hanging out there, right? It, it's very inviting. It allows for others to say, it's, this is safe, come on in, um, you know, pull up a, a picnic uh, basket. So I, I love, I love this, this collaboration. And I know that I think I'm not sure who mentioned it, but I know that it collaborations are never easy, right? There's two systems, two entities, two ways of doing things coming together for one purpose. And so I'm glad to hear that that's um, a lot neater and and that it's working. Avi, do you want to say something? Yeah. Yes, Chair, really briefly, you didn't ask a question in that, but I did want to echo your comments. It, it's not uh, strongly hit in our memo because we haven't quantified it yet, but anecdotally, the community has been very supportive of this pilot as Councilmember uh, Esparza mentioned. And in our planning team, meeting with further communities to, to develop new trail reaches, the success of this pilot is actually becoming a huge selling point that people see, like you said, that the activation will actually improve conditions. It, it, there has in the past been a concern of bringing maybe some negative unwanted attention, mm -hmm. but people see that the presence, the, the conservation corps members, the, the police officers, are actually mm -hmm. really improving a situation. So I just wanted to echo right. what you're saying. Keep, keeping folks accountable, right? now. Uh, they may think oh, there's not enough police officers. I'll just go back here and smoke this thing and do this, you know, open this container over here. Um, which l actually, thank you for reminding me, Avi. There was a question somewhere in there, <laughs> um, and that a follow-up question. That was, how do we figure out um, maybe how to address some of these things? Is there signage that we need to maybe have? Uh, maybe people don't know that you can't smoke and drink out in this trail um, is do you think that would be helpful or is it just maybe this beginning um, era of of a, of a presence uh, and taking people and having people learn that there's some accountability and there's going to be consequences when do we figure we, we might get signage or something if, if the, these things keep happening you know, I, I definitely think we can look at it just like a public park. The same, right. the same signage right, right. should be posted there so it's a constant reminder um, that there are consequences, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think the police department's taken a, a, a proactive measure to make to, to write the, the citation, which, which reduces it because we don't want to have it as a party zone, uh, as a stagnant party zone. We want to keep it, right. you know, so I, I think I, I would definitely recommend some of the same signage that's used at public parks 
uh, post it. Um, I think that 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 may help, and we can reevaluate after to see if it reduces the number. Wonderful. I'm not going to say assign TERS those who are uh, determined to do things, but at least it gives people a, a heads up, right, um, before that citation is is uh, written. The, the last question I had, uh, separate from this item, um, from separate from um, the signage um, concern, is the the arrests that that were um, done. Where was that? Was that usually violent altercations between people disagreeing on I who had the last piece of cake and I don't know whatever whatever triggers folks. So. I do recall one specific arrest that that made a lot of uh, it drew attention. It was a domestic violence incident that occurred uh, on the trail. Mm -hmm. um, so those come into play. You, you know what I mean. Uh, also, at times, weapons disturbance or making contact with an individual for one, like you know, an open container, and that leads to an arrest based off of being in possession of something like stolen property. Um, you know, some of the cars that have been located on the trail have been occupied, stolen vehicles. So those types of, um, um, and I know the stats don't break it down right, to say, right. but those are those are the concerns or in the the where the stats come from from a police perspective. Got it. Okay, so people were really taking um, this uh, trail as as a place to kind of hide. Um, um, and hopefully this will turn around. We'll see in the next report that you come in. Um, it'll you'll share with us and connect the dots and tell us a different story about about the trail, right? Okay. So thank thank you so much for the work that you're doing. I really appreciate it. Do we have a motion? Do yes, you? I made it. Oh, of course. Thank you. Um, and then let's do roll call. Jimenez. Yes. Esparza. Yes. Carrasco? Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that very wonderful presentation. Um, we're coming to an end. We the, the last item that we have is open forum. Do we have members of the public that want to speak? Yes, uh, one hand is up so far, caller 8755. Please go ahead. Hi, Fred Beekman here. I wanted to thank you for a good meeting today. Uh, interesting meeting. Um, tough end. <laughs> good meeting uh, overall, though. Uh, I. Uh, I wanted to comment on the, um, ma'am, you can go ahead of me. You can go. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to comment on the uh, uh, meeting you had this morning with Santa Clara County about the future of uh, uh, recidivism. And um, I, my, own, my two cents on the item is that, uh, uh, you know, in this age of reimagine, I, I hope that is kind of like in our minds as we make decisions for these sort of things uh, and that um, part of the reimagine process is to introduce um, concepts like how everyday community can be a part of the police department and say SEIU people can can do functions within the police department we don't have to staff with you know police administration uh, the same as in the past and it's those kind of concepts as we're talking about this subject that uh, I, I, I hope that that this on, in the front of our minds is how we talk about these sort of things. And a quick uh, other thought is that uh, good luck that we can all ask for peace for the Ukraine area and that we know how to ask for peace in the Ukraine area. And it's just a matter that, you know, we have good reimagined skills to do that, uh, uh, racial equity skills to do that. Uh, let's do it. Liz Holt. Hi, this is Liz Holtz again. Um, 
Anyways, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I do cat rescue, TNR. Um, lot i live here in evergreen i do the, a lot of work on the east side um and right now i need to bring to everybody's attention as much as possible that we are literally on the verge of a catastrophe pun intended but the result is not funny so just since year 2000 San Jose's population, just the city of San Jose's population has gone from 1.5 million to 1.8 million. All right. TNR services from the shelter have been challenged because there have been no improvements, expansions, um, anything to the shelter in over 20 years since it was built, which is ridiculous when we are have a growing population that is serviced by the San Jose Animal Center that includes not only the city of San Jose, but Cupertino, Los Gatos, Milpitas, and Saratoga. One of the things that we will want to bring to your attention is that one pair of cats, one female, one male, and stuff, year one, produce 12 kittens, assuming that there's three litters and two kittens that live, all right? First year. By the fifth year, which is where we are now going into, so fourth year since pre-COVID, all right? So now those two cats are now 2,107 cats. Going into next year, you're looking at 11,801 cats. And by the year 2024, those two cats starting in 2019 will have produced over 60,000. Nisa Marsislavska. Okay, I would like to talk about how the San Jose Animal Shelter is extremely underfunded. Um, I found a stray dog like last month. I called in to find out the hours and they told me they were at capacity and were not able to take the dog in. And this was like a friendly dog and I didn't have a place to house it. Um, San Jose Shelter services way too many cities. Um, there's way too many people with too many pets, especially during COVID, a lot of people adopted a lot of pets. Um, they're at capacity. They're not able to take any more cats in. Um, they got rid of the cat neutering program, so the cat population has exploded. So now there's a lot of people aren't being vocal, but there's hundreds of people like in San Jose that are continuously trying to like rescue animals and dogs and spending their own money on it. And they're unable to, and they're having trouble doing it. And I just wish we had more San Jose Animal Shelter support. Um, they're also servicing, I think, like Mopitas and Los Gatos. Um, so I'm not sure if those cities are helping fund our animal shelter. I would really like to see another facility, more staffing, um, higher salaries for the shelter, a lot more funding go to the shelter because it's quite a catastrophe um, currently what's going on. Um, and that's it. Catherine Valentine. Sorry, um, Catherine Valentine, I just wanted to actually follow up on the prior two comments about the San Jose Animal Shelter. Um, I'm new to the uh, issue of dealing with feral cats, but I am very concerned with the what I am seeing out in the uh, environment right now. And if you take a look at next door, uh, it also has a lot of comments about people's concerns. What eventually will happen without the DNR program is you will get to a point where you have so many cats that you will start hearing from people that don't like cats. And at that point, you will be in a no-win situation. The people that don't like cats will think a T excuse me, the TNR program is takes too long and that it doesn't reduce the population fast enough. And those um, people that are trying to work with the city now to reduce the population and take care of the animals will not be happy with any other type of method of reducing those animals other than TNR. As I said, the council will be in a no-win situation at that point. So I strongly advise that there be more funding uh, for the San Jose Animal Shelter, including uh, possibly increasing staff, uh, other the salaries of staff other than vets, 
and also that the TNR and spay and neuter programs be reinstated immediately. Thank you. That was the final speaker, back to the committee. Wonderful that um, I'm going to adjourn our meeting for Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. We'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone.